please tell us about the climate policy as if our lives depended upon it? So in our group, um, we talked about different uh, themes, so I'm going to break it down. So first of all, we talked about the fact that it's urgent. And more specifically, we talked about the North Atlantic current, uh, which, is be, which is being changed by a melting uh, Arctic, uh, which could potentially uh, lead to a net cooling for the Northern Hemisphere um, if this current would break down, uh, which it's on course to do. Um, we also talked about the fact that climate change is an opportunity. Climate change, climate action could be a win-win scenario if we tackled um, the potential of climate action. It could mean a better world, it could mean more well-being for people, and it could mean saved lives. The costs of climate action are fully compensated by the um, return on investment of its benefits. So we really need to flip the idea that climate action is costly, which is still the dominant narrative. We need to flip this narrative because benefits just aren't in the picture enough. And we talked about the fact that one of the challenges is that um, often politicians can't take credit uh, for the benefits of climate action or they're just not visible enough. We talked about the fact that we're not doing nearly enough to tackle the climate challenge. In Paris in 2015, we promised well below 2 degrees and to pursue 1.5 degrees. But it's not adding up right now. With the national contributions of countries, it's just not adding up. And the new IPCC report, which is a new report of experts on climate change, is telling us that the impacts of temperature rises are much more dire than what we expected. So as someone eloquently put it, uh, 1.5 is the new 2 degrees. We also talked about the fact that the Europe's claim of leadership doesn't add up as well. In recent years, our emissions have stopped declining. They're actually going up. And that's not even touching on the fact that we often don't include our consumption in the calculation of our emissions. So to put it briefly, we've become laggards. Despite our historical responsibility and our capacity, financial uh, especially, to initiate an energy and um, more broadly economic transition. So then we talked about what's next for us. What are the conclusions that we can take away uh, from uh, this dire picture? The first thing we said is we need a bigger church because the scale of this challenge is not to be underestimated. We're talking about uh, a radical transformation of our economic model. So we said we need to think holistically, we need to think of radical change, and we need to stop limiting uh, this challenge to a, technical, to a technical debate. We need big, bold political decisions um, that will affect every area of uh, policy decision making. We need also greater collaboration between movements. We need to bring in the health movement, trade unions, anti-poverty organizations. We need to be reaching out to a much broader uh, spectrum of allies. We also spoke about the need for hope and optimism in the face of fear, especially in a context of rising populism. But at the same time, we talked about the need for um, a better communication of the urgency of this challenge um, to strike the right balance. We also um, concluded on the potential of scaling up uh, initiatives that speak to a wide public and that work. So in particular, we spoke about the ongoing uh, climate legislation case uh, where families are bringing the EU to court over climate inaction. We talked about the coal blockades that are happening now in Germany that are growing bigger every year to block coal infrastructure and to demand that policymakers shift away from coal in Germany. And we talked about the divestment movement that has already pulled trillions of euros away from the fossil fuel industry. Thank you very much for that news headlines about uh, your breakout group on climate policy. Does anybody have a question for Clemence about anything that she said? Beautifully comprehensive. Let's move on then uh, to Luke. 
and uh, obviously from the IUCN and tell us about protecting our life support systems. Thank you. Um, well, I will start by saying that everything you said would work very well uh, for what needs to happen on, on protecting nature and restoring nature and, and safeguarding the ecosystems that we all uh, depend on. Um, we started to immediately to look into uh, the connection between global, European level, national level, local level, but also to make sure that we connect not just mainstreaming in other sectors, but even within the environment community, which is sometimes not happening enough. And at some point, we talked about the climate people. <laughs> I was a climate person uh, five years ago, and working on climate a lot. Uh, and there was a bit of this feeling, why is the climate community more successful than the nature community <laughs> in getting uh, action going? And when I hear you, it seems like, oh, there's not hardly anything happening there. And so in the nature context, it's actually even worse, because if you look at what funds go in there, what, uh, there's some good regulation at the European level, of course, but it doesn't get implemented enough. Um, there's some great examples on enforcement. Uh, uh, Client Earth was in our group and, and, and giving the example of some cases that they had been winning, which is really interesting. So the system works. There's still not enough access to justice and not regulated enough in the European context. That was one of the comments made there. So but mainly it came down to how do we make this really happen? How do we implement? How do we uh, enforce what's already there? And how we can then make a case that is potentially similar to the climate debate in which there was a bit of a mixed feeling in the group but the doom scenario in the climate context may have gotten the attention and the media attention but may not have been the main reason why there is some a bit more action on that field. Still not enough, far from, especially the 1.5 degrees report. Um, but still it's happening and it's because there is the, the, and you said the benefit case isn't made enough, but again, in the nature context, we have to be getting even better in making the case for the investment in nature. We are, even the community itself, and it's something that you feel when you, when you are in a group, by the way, our group was very, um, yeah, biodiversity nature focused. I think we had one farmer in the group, which was a relief, because that's actually, we should have had at least 10 there uh, to have a real discussion about, about what, should, uh, what should change in the European context. Um, so, how do we, and that actually led us to how do we change the narrative around getting some action, getting away from this notion of cost of protecting nature and the cost of restoration into what is an investment. Of course that's not easy and it's also sensitive, especially in the conservation community and ISM has a very wide membership and the discussions are continuously going on on how we can do this. But bottom line is that among ourselves we can speak our language in the very, uh, let's say, maybe technical, but also with love for nature and, and all make the intrinsic cases, and we should continue to do so. And ISN has worked around this nexus and even talks about nature, uh, rights for nature as a different departing point in the legal system even. But we need to, we really need to, to, to change the language in, into benefits. What does that mean? It's natural capital. What is natural capital? How do, you how do you define it? And then most of all, and this is the sensitive part, how do you account for it? And you need to have that debate to start to talk to those that are most likely not in the room here. And I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands. Maybe this happened already this morning. But I think we're just, uh, again, nicely among ourselves and exchanging, but in potentially not really reaching who we want to reach. And if you talk about accounting, then you will see where the means might be coming from because then you will have some way of making an investment case in the unfortunately maybe within the current economic paradigm that said of course the economic paradigm needs to change we need to make the first system changes which is still not really happening but we have what we have now there is a sense of urgency we can keep on talking to each other about the intrinsic value we have to continue to grow the church i think that's what you said we need uh, more people that are convinced for the intrinsic reasons to do all this, but if we really want to have a change now, then we have to start talking differently to the ones that can make a change. Um, because we have come to a point where nature and biodiversity community and the targets that have been set maybe are getting some credibility challenge. We said hold the loss of biodiversity by 2010. And then we said it again, hold the loss of biodiversity by 2020. 
And apparently, I don't know one example, I still want to test it, but apparently in Holland, the loss of biodiversity has been halted. I was told by Natuurmonumenten and NGOs, so I, I could kind of believe it when they say it. Um, but that's in Holland, and honestly, you know how much biodiversity was, and nature was lost there. I mean, there's not so much left to actually still continue to lose it. So by restoring, they have stopped the loss, which is great. But overall, we're not even close anywhere. So we have a credibility issue. And then one of the, 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 the debates was in the post-2020 framework, we cannot just say, yes, we will hold biodiversity loss by 2030. Because nobody, will be, honestly, we will be laughed at. So we need to dare to say, and this is where the parallel made with the climate change agenda comes, and this is not easy, but we have to dare to say how much loss would we actually still accept and how do we get it down to, let's say, the vision of 2050, where then it should be really over with the loss, because it's really, it's, it's devastating at the moment what we lose on, on nature and biodiversity. So those were a few of those reflections um, from the National Capital Coalition. There was a very good explanation on, on what the tools are uh, in place where businesses can make use of how to account uh, for natural capital, and even more important, how the governments will be doing at some point. If in Europe we want such a tool to be used well, we have to be very careful that it doesn't become a market because that's a, f a fear that is a rightful fear and ICM will continue to watch or be the watchdog that it doesn't derail, but it's one opportunity that we need to use and that will create hopefully um, a bit more resources from the private sector as well, which is another element uh, where ICM has been involved with the, with the private investment sector, the Coalition for Private Investment for Conservation where we try to make the case and the blueprints for private investors to, to put uh, money into getting uh, beyond the public debate. And I will wrap it up with the one big challenge that we cannot look, um, we cannot ignore, obviously, and that is how will we deal with the biggest pressure on biodiversity in Europe, which is from unsustainable agriculture. Um, this has been debated, I'm sure, this morning as well. Uh, how can we make a real, a real shift there? How, and what is the strategy to actually do that? And ultimately, and we had the one farmer in our group, which I guess was also a progressive farmer, but it, we will need to have the farmers on our side. And so in that group, it was debated with an attempt how to do it. And I said we'll continue to try to be a bridge maker between the environment NGOs and the farmers, and we will do so in the, in the coming weeks and months. If that will be on time for a decision of the council uh, on the cap um, is, is still to be seen, but we can only hope that uh, it will not be watered down when the member states uh, decide on it. And we said, look, we have to be very clear. If, if the public money is being used, it has to have a public uh, service, and it can be quite easily measured. And the farmer gave the example of there is public money, cap funding, used or paid to drain peatlands. I mean, how much from, from a perspective of society at large can that be accepted? So if the CAP proposal that advocated by the European Commission in our session holds opportunities, and ICN does see some opportunities, although potentially many more risks, uh, if it gets diluted and, and, and wrongly used, but if those opportunities are used, then we should really be able to measure it. And ultimately, if at the end, a common agricultural policy uh, and the funding with it would not uh, be used for draining peatlands, I would think that would be a success. And that's a very clear indicator, I think. So just, we wanted to move into very clear indicators. Maybe one last point I cannot uh, forget as well is the global responsibility of the, of the European Union in uh, how we consume. And there were some examples from Portugal, and then I had the opportunity to use the Portugal uh, surface example in which uh, in the years between 2010 and 2015, uh, the size of the area of Portugal uh, was deforested just for the EU consumption, commodity consumption in the EU. That's the size in five years' time it was deforested. And those are scary numbers, and if the doom scenario needs to work in the same way it might have worked or not have worked in the climate debate, then I think such, uh, so those kind of statements are crucial, and we should really be aware of, uh, of how we have to tackle our, and systemically tackle our consumption, not just the pattern or how we consume, but actually also the volume. And that is, maybe as a last line, a very uncomfortable truth that you will have to reduce consumption in Europe. 
Thank you very much, Luke, for that inconvenient <coughs> truth. Are there any questions? Rather a grim report on biodiversity <laughs> loss. Michael, towards a toxic non-circular <coughs> economy. Please. Uh, not a toxic non-circular, a circular non-toxic. A circular non-toxic. <laughs> that would be better. If I could read my writing, that would help. Yes, so we were talking about um, the non-toxic circular economy. So a few examples of the problem we talked about at the, in our discussion, just to get you in the mood. Um, so one of the most old ones is called at least the PCBs, which were used in transformers. Um, but lesser known uses included building sealants and flame retardant paint and all sorts of different things. And people thought they'd been dealt with. You know, we've been destroying transformers, we've got a Stockholm Convention. But the reality is the levels in um, orca, killer whales around Europe, are uh, enough to stop them breeding. And some scientists did some modeling, published a few weeks ago, which said that half of the world's populations will be, will be destroyed, basically, through failure to breed. And these are chemicals that aren't just in transformers, they're also in building sealants. And Swiss researchers have hung around outside buildings on the street with samplers, and they can detect PCBs, particularly from the right sort of 60s and 70s buildings. So these problems are out there, um, and we're not really doing much about them. We think we are, but we aren't. And then we have brominated flame retardants. <coughs> Very similar group of chemicals. You've almost certainly got some in your homes, in your furniture, uh, furniture recycling is a nightmare anyway, but if someone started worrying about brominated flame retardants, which at the moment they don't, um, then that would be a problem too. But brominated flame retardants are in our bodies, they're in, also in the whales. We don't know as much about their effects as the PCBs. <coughs> so it's a big problem, and they also turn up, interestingly, in um, some black plastic food contact items, this is like labels and things, from being recycled from our computer systems plastic from computers. Um, so, you know, there's a number of problems, and the more recently we've got the, the perfluorinated chemicals. Uh, just to say, actually, some brominated flavotons are still in production and use. The perfluorinated are interesting because they are very persistent, very mobile, they're good at contaminating drinking water, um, and they're also being used in compostable packaging. So then you put your compostable packaging in the compost, and then you've got your perfluorinated uh, chemicals in your soil. Um, so they're quite interesting, they're unusual, they don't accumulate in fat, they do things like bind to uh, blood cells, red blood cells, and we've all got them in us. Um, and you constantly get, with the, all these chemicals, you get this idea of moving between one chemical in a group to another, the constant sort of, oh, that chemical's banned, let's do the next one. So that's an idea of a problem. And, you know, the, it's a very complex issue because your chemicals are being used throughout your value chain. Even if you don't have a circular economy, things are going to come from different places. You know, these carpets, the ink will have come from one place, the fiber, the backing. It's very, very complex. And so one of the solutions we were discussing was the idea of having much more information going through the supply chains. Um, and clearly some companies are more keen on that than others. Um, and also the issue of a producer of a chemical working much more with their downstream users and saying, well, actually, do you need that chemical? Could you not do it a different way? Um, but these are all changes to the way things are done at the moment. And an important point then is obviously you have recycled products, and then you have even less control on what's actually happening, because you don't know how the plastic bottle was used. You don't know if you get a pizza box, um, it could have uh, bisphenol A in it, an, another unpleasant chemical coming from till receipts that have been recycled. Even though till receipts don't have much paper fibre in them, you can still recycle them and they go into your pizza box. Um, and just to make you more worried, uh, it's not just the deliberate chemicals, you also get the creation of chemicals from impur there are impurities in the starting material, there are reaction products, and so you get these things called non-intentionally added substances, which are talked about in food contact because you measure what's migrated into your food and you find a very exciting <coughs> number of chemicals, much higher levels than you find pesticides, for example. Um, but interestingly, in other areas of chemicals, we don't tend to talk about NIAS at all, even though they will exist in other products, but we tend to ignore them. Um, so that's the sort of complexity of the issue. So what can you actually do to try and reduce the problem? And it's very clear you can do better design for circularity. That's the best thing, is you deal with it at the start, 
We avoid the hazardous chemicals, and we try and also avoid the chemicals that will become hazardous in the future. If you're going to have a sofa that's sitting there for 30 years, um, you don't necessarily want the chemical to be banned in five years, which is what happens at the moment. Um, don't substitute one chemical with a similar one. And remember that just because we can export recyclables for processing in the rest of the world, it doesn't mean it's a good thing to do, particularly if we export the most difficult to recycle and then they're dealt with badly. And on an issue like plastics, um, there's an argument that there are some applications where plastics are important, but there are other applications where much better materials would be, for example, compostable materials if you're dealing with um, you know, outdoor eating festival. So that's some of the design. And on, on the regulation for circularity, we were in a funny situation in Europe. We have a lot of regulations. There are areas missing. Food contact is, is very poor, for example. Uh, it's basically minimal regulation of paper and card food contact, including recycled. Um, <clears throat> we have a problem that the EU was due to do a non-toxic environment strategy, which was due to be completed in 2018. Um, it's looking unlikely that that will be achieved in the next couple of months. So we have these things that were put in place which were very good, but are then not being delivered. Um, we can see that current laws don't cope well with these long-term threats like the persistent chemicals like BFRs, the, the PFAS. And that was one of the things that non-toxic environments actually was supposed to address, but it hasn't been done, so we're going to have to carry on pushing into the next commission. And one of the problems that's there with regulation is that sometimes the push for a level playing field is essentially the laggard companies trying to keep the standards down so the front-running companies get <laughs> pulled back by companies saying, oh, we need a level playing field, or we know you can't disclose all that information, we're not going to cope with that. So we need to be aware that um, we need to push forward and also use things like public procurement to help do that. You know, we need stuff on safety of circular economy and materials. We don't want to create a dirty circular economy. For one thing, it's not very good for our health or for the environment. And the other thing, it's going to completely destroy the circular economy concept. I mean, already, if you buy toys, it will quite often have a label. If it comes from China, it says contains no recycled materials. Um, so you can really see the food contact materials, for example, where at the moment there isn't the regulation on non-plastic ones, and the plastic regulation is deficient. And I think, finally, to look up to the global level, there are opportunities at global level. There is a review of the main um, strategic approach to chemicals management, SICAM. Um, because that only runs until 2020. Um, and there's also a, attached to that a review of sound management of chemicals and waste. So there is this debate on what happens after 2020, and that's also something that people need to look at and focus on, see where the opportunities are to make sure we get something better in Europe and then also something better globally. Thank you very much. Oh. It's a bit bleak, isn't it, the outlook for biodiversity, climate action, and uh, uh, getting rid of these uh, chemicals. Would anybody like to ask any questions of our experts? OK. Well, I'd like to give a round of applause then, please. Thank you, Clemence. Thank you. And, uh, thank you. Yes, please. Question, do we have any hope? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe we can do a round of solutions. Huh? Well, maybe, yes, you gave us solutions, but you really I seem think, to uh, have the solutions. I think, the, uh, yes, yeah, I would say in general, if you look where we were 15 years ago, we were trying to say Europe needs a new system for regulating chemicals. Europe has that system. It's not perfect, but it exists, and it's making progress. Um, and I think there is more activity at global level, and I think Europe can do a lot more to assist that, for example, with the safety information on chemicals. So I think there is progress being made, but there's still a lot of gaps. And one of the biggest problems in the last few years has been this obsession with supposedly better regulation, which basically means, in, means deregulation or stopping regulation. So there's been a lot of time wasting. There's been a lot of refits done, which have just said, oh, look, no, we've spent several years on this, we've spent lots and lots of money, and actually it's all right. Um, maybe we should be looking at what we need to do to improve things. So I think there is, you know, we are in quite a good position in Europe on, on chemicals and pollution, 
but there's been a real stasis as well. And you can look at water pollution as well. You've got similar issues. We need to actually move in the next commission to really trying to strengthen these and make sure these frameworks are comprehensive in Europe and then assist other countries and other regions in adopting these approaches. I gave you some, some very scary numbers, yes, and I can give you even more, but I won't. Um, and I do think that I made a comment on what we could do. So I made a comment about how we can make a case for investment, how we should change the language, how we have to potentially educate the ones not in this room, because I think they're all educated to what, uh, to what uh, nature needs and, and what needs to happen. But then we go out there with, with some clear, uh, clear messages and also measurable and reportable and verifiable uh, action or even commitments that will, will be brought to the table. And one of these um, strategies now is to have some comparability to the Paris Agreement with a, let's say, call it a global deal for nature, in which uh, alongside the regulatory framework, which I really believe needs to be, continue to be strong at all levels, but that there is also this bringing to the table, what are we doing and showcasing that how much benefit this results in and that you get it from all level players and maybe one that hasn't been mentioned enough is the local and the, and the regional governments. The cities on the one hand obviously, but also the regional governments because they have, often have the competency over the ecosystems around a city that serve the city. And so the regional governments have a huge responsibility and opportunity to do so and there is a lot of movement happening and you see this uh, for example also now at the CBD again at this, at this uh, summit. So a lot of actors that can bring commitments to the table, voluntary if you like, maybe some will be pushed by, by the regulation. And as we talk about opportunities, the pathway to the 2020, post-2020 agenda has a few nice opportunities on the way. Of course now in two weeks the CBD in, in Egypt, but um, I also want to remind you of the World Conservation <coughs> Congress of ICN in June 2020, before the decisive moment uh, at the COP15 in, uh, in Beijing, in, uh, in China, uh, in 2020. And we will organize this in France, with support from the French government. And we have been told that uh, the French government wants to take this to the highest level possible. And we hope, therefore, that there would be some sort of heads of state on nature. We have had it on climate, but maybe this would be the opportunity where President Macron uh, would invite for heads of state to speak to nature. And France has a reasonably good record on regulation and a new biodiversity plan that comes with a few hundred of millions extra of funding. So there's at least something moving there. So just to try to give a few of the positive sides here. Yes. So, <clears throat> so we did speak about some of the positive things that are happening. We talked about the fact that you don't know that you're in a transition when you are in the midst of a transition. And we talked about the fact that climate action um, has never been so understood by uh, the public and that um, the necessity of climate action has never been so recognized by policymakers, by people, and even uh, businesses. Um, at the same time, global emissions every year increase. So, so it is a huge challenge, and as I said, it's about, it's not about uh, technical solutions, it's about big and bold po political decisions uh, that will affect the structure of our economic model itself. So, so I would say there is hope, and I think we, we did a good job of, of thinking constructively about the reasons for hope, and maybe to outline a few. So as I said, um, the climate movement is growing. Um, as I said, in Germany, every year uh, the movement against coal is bigger. Um, the divestment uh, movement is going strong after years um, and, and gaining bigger battles. Um, And I think what we concluded on is that we need to continue working with this broad array of allies and we need to hold our leaders accountable because we, it's not going to come from the top down. I, we, we, we really insisted on the fact that it's going to come from the bottom up um, and it's going to require 
mobilizing people, but also policy work to, to make sure that the policy action is at the level needed. Um, so reasons for hope, but uh, lots to do, I would say. <laughs> Thank you very much. Luke, yes, you have a final announcement yeah. to make. Here's the point, the moment in time where we say, what can you do? <laughs> No, I've just been asked by EEB, and as a good partner of EEB, I will make a call uh, to you all uh, to remind you to take part in the EC European Commission public consultation on the Water Framework Directive. Just to defend, it's really important to defend strong EU water laws. But you can check it on the website and get some inspiration for the consultation, I assume. But that's a really crucial element that may have not come up in these three panels so much on water. And of course, we, all, we know as at ICN that the Water Framework Directive, as it is and as it was and hopefully will continue, has done a lot for freshwater species, not in the least. So it is not only the nature and the, the nature directives, but it's also the Water Framework Directive that has done a lot of, uh, for the protection of aquatic biodiversity. So go there and do the consultation. That's the call from EEB, and ICN supports it wholeheartedly. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Clemens. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Michael, for your hard work in summarizing the main facts from your breakout groups. I give you another round of applause for your hard work. Well done. Thank you.